Welcome to the Battle Blitz webinar series. The title of this session is Roaring Data, How Recovery Data Will Guide Quant Strategy Returns. From jobs data, transaction data, fund flows, ESG, and the rotation from growth to value, this will be a comprehensive analysis of the data reflecting one of the most turbulent eras of our economy. My name is Bart Kellerman and I will be your host today. This interactive webinar has a live audience with a Q&A session at the end. You are invited to type your question into the Q&A box anytime and use this for any technical issues as well. For any press on the webinar, please follow Chatham House rules. First of all, I would like to thank our sponsors. Refinitiv is a data company which provides data, analytics, trading, and risk assessment tools so you can trade smarter and faster overcome regulatory challenges, and scale intelligently. Refinitiv is an LSEG, London Stock Exchange Group business. Thank you, Refinitiv. Factius is a leading provider of actionable insights from alternative financial transactions data, giving business and investment executives access to the truth of actual consumer financial transactions, not just general trends. Thank you, Factius. EPFR, a subsidiary of Informa, provides fund flows and asset allocation data to financial institutions around the world. Informa delivers a complete picture of institutional and retail investor flows and fund manager allocations driving global markets. Thank you, EPFR Informa Financial Intelligence. I would like to point out that we have over 250 registered attendees this morning. The attendees represent a broad set of international quantitative industry professionals, including quantitative managers, data providers, data buyers, and a variety of institutional investors. First, we will hear from our keynote, Adam Barron, and then from data providers and those that are using the data to generate alpha. The panelists will highlight the data that is going to be best used to reflect the world's business return to normal. Adam is the director of Big Data Quantitative Research at Refinitiv. Adam has done a tremendous job in analyzing link-up jobs data as it relates to analyst upgrades and downgrades. Adam will demonstrate how important jobs data is as we come pandemic shadows reactions. What you will see is a definitive trading opportunity with a signal. Let me hand off to Adam. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm from San Francisco here. Uh, so before I jump in, I should probably give a quick disclaimer. You are going to see some code here, but please don't get scared. I'm not going to be talking about the code. It's actually because this is very fresh research of mine and the code has generated the charts and tables that you will see. So <clears throat> LinkUp is a recent partnership with Refinitiv. They capture job postings data directly from company websites. Um, so it's not like Indeed or Monster. <clears throat> and we offer it through the Refinitiv Quantitative Analytics platform. Um, it's like a database which has a bunch of traditional financial content sets, such as pricing, fundamentals, estimates, ownership, and as well as this alternative data, which pairs very well together. So the link up, the, the time series we'll be looking at is pretty straightforward from link up. It's just the company, a daily time series. And on each day, um, you know, how many jobs were posted and deleted. But what I really like looking at is the unique active job counts, the tally of how many jobs are active on their job board at that day. Um, before we dive into specific company examples, we're gonna, let's look at some overall industry trends. There's another content set from Refinitiv, TRBC, the Refinitiv Business Classification, which has um, sectors, industries to like five levels of granularity. So we're gonna look at a three month change window of job postings aggregated. So before we look at actual industries, just know that this is a very promising trend. Um, it means overall industries are hiring. Um, at the top, we have things like leisure pro uh, products, 
um, commercial risk, passenger transport, which is like airlines, um, consumer goods, very promising. At the bottom, there are some, but not too many, um, like miscellaneous educational services and uranium, actually. Um, and just as a quick uh, detour here, we should, know, we should always look at the numbers when we see extreme percentages. So with uranium, they went from 19 jobs to four, so not that big of a deal. But the other ones um, on the extremes of the largely positive or largely negative are big numbers, so we can trust their percentages. So yes, um, even kicking out that one outlier at the end, it's a pretty good trend overall for the workforce. Um, now, we should probably look at this data alongside, as we go to individual companies, alongside other content sets. So whereas the job postings have the company sentiments about the future, let's see what the analysts think. So Refinitiv has something called IBEZ, um, consensus estimates. So IBEZ also contains the individual analyst estimates from the sell side banks about what they think the numbers will be for various financial items like revenue, et cetera. Um, the consensus is the equal weighted mean. Um, and just for fun, we're also going to be looking at the Starmine smart estimates. I come from Starmine myself. Um, smart estimates was the first analytic well before my time, but essentially we give a one to five star rating to analysts based on how good their estimates are compared to their peers, um, five being the best and we weight their estimate um, higher. It's, the estimate is weighted higher towards the better analyst. So you're really seeing what the leaders are uh, thinking about the company. So let's look at those three content sets together. The first um, one we're gonna look at is Ambev. They create beer and other soft drinks. And if you look at this yellow line, you'll see that there's been a pretty good hiring trend, uh, pretty good trend of hiring since September of job postings on their website. Um, I guess the intuition is that as, restrictions lift, people will be continuing to go to restaurants and bars and um, sporting events, and movie theaters, and drinking more of their products. Um, and then, let's see, and then in the uh, purple line here, that is the consensus estimate, the mean um, of the analyst uh, revenue forecast. You'll see that it actually, there was a pretty uh, decent gap here in September, uh, from September to November before they actually got bullish with their revenue estimate. And there's a little kick up too in February. Um, and that smart estimate I mentioned from Starmine uh, is in purple. It too, it was slightly ahead of the consensus in that the leaders, the five-star analysts were revising upwards before the herd kind of um, got on. So these charts are great for humans like us to analyze, but um, you know machines probably want to encapsulate this in one signal. So um, I did create a little analytic. Um, I did create an analytic that called analyst awareness, where um, I look at change windows over the past 30 days um, of the two of both the um, job postings and the analyst uh, revisions, and if there's a difference then it will deviate greatly from zero. So that, that's what you have here. So by the way, this, um, this notebook also exists on the Refinitiv developer um, community. So if you are a code geek like myself and you wanna get into this, you can just uh, jump in there and have a look. Um, so yeah, and then, uh, okay. So, but since we're humans, we're not gonna be really, you know, we'll focus more on these other charts. So let's get into some other, um, companies here. CB Richards Ellis is into uh, commercial real estate, and they too have been having a good, uh, good hiring trend. And also, as well, um, analysts have uh, you know followed you know followed on after the fact, um, both in November and in March of revising their revenue up. So I should probably take a sidebar here and mention our intuition behind the job postings. So um, with the job postings, our thoughts are either that they're reactive or proactive. They could be reactive to events that have happened um, and the, the company will change their job postings accordingly. And you know, the sell side analysts are also following the news and attending the company's earnings calls and they're really on top of this. So if some event happen, they will have revised accordingly, maybe before the company changed their job postings. But if the company is anticipating something in the future, or maybe has information the analysts don't know, then their job postings will signal um, something that the analysts will eventually learn. So that's why we're seeing some of these um, gaps here of job postings before the analysts react. It can go both ways, but that's why you need to look at both. That's the important part. Um, and the final example on the positive side is Fiat Chrysler. So once again, 
job postings were really positive um, from September till now. And it wasn't until late January that the analysts caught up. I guess the intuition here is that um, as restrictions start lifting, people are going to start traveling more and they need cars to do so. But it's not all rosy. There are some examples of companies that have been paring back on their job postings. Um, you know, during the pandemic, a very unfortunate situation where the, um, you know, the, the impact to senior living, um, and we see here with capital senior living, their jobs have been drastically decreasing um, ac across the past six months there. And it wasn't until just mid-March that the analysts also got bearish on their revenue. So that, that uh, area is not doing so well. Um, Laureate Education, they have online college classes. I think they have some physical classes in South America too. Um, you know, as, we probably, as you've probably seen in the news, um, the, the non-top tier uni universities aren't doing that well. So we see that they too have paired back jobs. And this is one of those cases where the analysts were actually ahead of the, um, the company pulling back jobs and that's okay. Like I said before, sometimes the job posting um, change is a reaction to something. And it's okay if the analysts are ahead of them because you're not looking at the signal solely, you have to look at it in relation to the Wall Street sentiment. Um, and then finally, in the negative examples, there's Michael Kors. So um, they were very, very bearish with their job postings pulling back consistently but the analysts were bullish. So this is very interesting. Like in November, they thought that things were really ticking up and they stayed that way for a while until February, they finally got aligned with Michael Kors. So there was a huge lead time of disconnect between which direction um, the company versus the analysts thought things were going. So maybe, you know, people are gonna go out and start buying stuff, but they're not gonna be buying luxury purses. So I think I'd like to conclude with two examples that you know, make me scratch my head about what's going on here. But those are the interesting ones, uh, you know, for, for quants, right? So um, MGM Resorts, very consistently hiring, analysts keep dogging them. And then the same thing with Lufthansa, um, been hiring consistently, analysts keep revising down. So, you know, what's going on here? I mean, is this another Michael Kors case where there's just a big disconnect and eventually the company is going to be right? Or maybe the analysts are right and the company's just being naive. You know, I personally think people are gonna start getting on planes and going to hotels and casinos, but who knows? And this is actually the opportunity for those quants out there who have their other data, even more data sets to look at um, and more signals to analyze. And you know, this disconnect here as would have been um, picked up by that analyst awareness signal I mentioned earlier would be the opportunity to really dig in further and try to answer the question about why is there such a differing opinion. So with that, I should probably um, pass the torch on to the other folks to show you some other types of uh, content that's out there. That's, that's really what you're saying. By using series from Lincoln on jobs, you can, um, if, if you can really understand what's behind that number, predict what analyst upgrade or downgrade is going to be a new estimate. And uh, maybe there's an advantage there. There's some alpha generation there. Yeah, yeah. It's really important to look at the two in combination because alone you're really not seeing the whole picture. Right. And you have the uh, the technology behind all of this to do the right analysis in order to give you uh, an answer as to whether or not it's what's the analyst thinking or what why is the analyst making that upgrade or downgrade or revenue estimate. Yeah, well, I'm presenting some options. Ultimately, you know, our audience here has so much data to them. Our, our other, the other folks on the call are going to talk about it. But looking at all this together, you can have a mosaic to really try to figure out what's going on and come up with those answers. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, you're going to um, be available on the panel for any questions uh, in con conjunction with all the other data sources that we're going to be talking about. So thank you very much for a, a great keynote, Adam, and very informable, very useful for a lot of people looking to try and figure out where these markets are going to be going. Um, that is fascinating. Thank you for that, those valuable insights. We're now going to move on to our uh, panel discussion. And here is our illustrious uh, panel. And I would like to introduce the moderator of our panel discussion, Elizabeth Pritchard. Uh, Elizabeth Pritchard is the CEO and founder of White Rock Data Solutions. After having a successful career at Goldman Sachs, AIG, and Crux, and focusing on the commercial impact of data, Elizabeth now leverages that expertise to help hedge funds activate their own in data. 
okay, Elizabeth, looks like you have all the right talent on hand to evaluate the broad perspective of data that, we will, that will tell us uh, how the global economy, economy will come roaring back. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm gonna hand it off to you, take it away. Terrific, thank you, Bart. Bart, you've really put together a fantastic panel of data experts to look at what the data is saying about the recovery through different lenses. Thank you all for being here today. All right, let's get right into it. Mohammed, we'll start with you. You have a unique and rare combination, Mohammed, of 25 years of expertise, deeply rooted in tech, data science, and content, fundamental and alternative. You are bringing thought leadership to extracting insights from new sources of data to develop trading strategies. And coupled with ex your experience at top hedge funds, Carlson, Viking, e Eaton Park, you are driving the data-driven ecosystem forward. And now you're bringing these capabilities to your role as chief data officer at Factius. Good to have you here. So Mohammed, you've seen it all. Why don't you set the table for us and share your perspective regarding the shifts last year and what we should plan for going forward into the recovery. Over to you, Mohammed. Um, so I wanted to say thanks, Elizabeth, and, and pleasure to join you here today. Um, I think most of us would agree that we're on a very interesting intersection with many factors that can swing the recovery in either direction. And it's uh, kind of uncharted territory for, for most of us. Um, so as you can see here, um, I don't think we have enough data points to fully understand the unique interaction of all those factors. So it will be hard to forecast them using traditional uh, models as we did in the past. Um, in this case, I, I think adopting a more reactionary approach might be the best option. Uh, but the challenge here is identifying the data that can help me adopt and refine my investment thesis in a timely and uh, accurate manner. On the next slide, um, I would argue that the consumer transaction data is probably one of the best ways to analyze consumer spending behavior and the near-term impact of each of those factors on recovery. Um, as you see here, this is how the data track the spending patterns right after the first and second stimulus payments across uh, different verticals and retailers. And it provided instant transparency into how much and where the payments were spent. Uh, so here, directionally speaking, there, there is no question this was very valuable and timely for any type of fundamental driven analysis. But the big question here is what happened to systematic models that use the alternative data pre-COVID uh, to forecast KPIs for uh, focused on alpha generation. Um, so on the next slide, uh, as you can see here, what happened is the top is, you know, what a simple model used to generate a very high level of efficacy um, in tracking a specific KPI relative to a single name, in this case, uh, for, for a cake. Um, before COVID, and then you contrast that with how deteriorated that signal is during the first three quarters of the last year. In our views, and you can see that captured in the bottom chart, this was a product of inherent bias in every one of those data panels currently available in terms of geography, age group, and income levels. Um, and those different cohorts suffered a very asymmetrical impact during the different stages of the pandemic. Not to mention that there is a rapid shift from physical in-store purchase to e-commerce and online shopping. Most of our panels and all the commercial panels out there are over-representing uh, that online uh, trend. So on the next slide, um, I would see that the opportunity ahead is actually in leveraging as many as needed data panels with diversified views on same fundamental measures. Uh, beside that, I would also, you know, we're finding panels uh, that express views on more detailed levels, such as specific segments of revenue. Uh, for example, adding panels that uh, expose corporate transaction is a good idea for businesses with segments driven by both retail, uh, consumer and business spend. 
Uh, but we've also been getting a lot of demand for uh, incorporating data panels with view and other measures. So things like cost of revenue, labor cost, inventory, and commodity inflation, there is a lot of demand for that. Um, and it's driven by a lot of focus on more deeper analysis into the income statement uh, below the top line. Um, I would say this creates a great opportunity for investors looking for an add-on source of alpha originating from leveraging unique combination of those alternative data panels, overlay their secret sauce and generate less correlated uh, returns with the market. Uh, and here we list some of our observation and suggestions on how to start combining those panels. And I'll be more than happy to go into more details during our uh, Q&A discussion. All right. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, the key lesson I'm learning here is that the aggregate is not sufficient and that we really need to be much more granular and go deeper to find those insights that are going to generate the alpha. Terrific. Thank you. That's a great start. Let's move over to Syed. Syed Baronian, let's hear your perspective. As Director of Quantitative Research at EPFR Informal Financial Intelligence in London, you are generating systematic investment and trading strategies. You bring a really unique blend of experience to the role. Coming from your impressive track record leading HSBC's multi-asset funds in Istanbul prior to your current role. Syed, can you bring us into the risks you are seeing in the market from ownership and positioning data? What is the data telling you about how the risks are changing versus what we saw last year? Over to you, Syed. Thank you, Elizabeth. And th thanks for the great introduction. Uh, obviously, 2020 was a year of changes and challenges um, on many fronts, and this has affected the behavior of the investors. Um, looking at EPFR fund flows and allocations data, the first thing that we have observed was the change in the speed of rotation. Different countries, um, currencies, or different sectors in different regions, um, even more so on value versus growth funds recently, we saw um, the same similar tendency, and that was the volatility of flows. The rotation speed has, has changed uh, pace. And maybe most interest, interestingly on the next slide, um, from a multi-asset perspective, we see the same increase in the rot rotation speed. And also, as you can see, the uncertainty around the inflation expectations was the main driver of this increase in rotation speed. These two measures, the um, rotation speed and uh, the inflation expectations, uh, historically are really correlated. And, and we, we, can, we can see that um, the increase in inflation expectations and the uncertainty around that has also started to move the markets in, and then increase the rotation speed. So moving on to the next chart, the rotation speed is increasing. The, the money is changing its, its course faster and faster. And as a result, we have such a dynamic fluid environment in our hand. So here we have a second important observation about this one, and that is the ownership structure of a security, um, which is becoming more and more important in determining its, its price sections. So we look at the EPFR's stock level positioning data, and we see that investor base, um, if, if an investor base of a security is, is diverse, then it is less likely to see um, high volatility in stress times. This is also true at the aggregate level, um, whether months with higher dispersed, diverse investor base in the market, um, so lower volatility, especially in 2020, or in the cross-section of countries, um, countries with a more diverse investor base uh, generally saw uh, lower uh, volatility. So on the last chart, on the next slide, in, in this environment, we see that some sectors in the market, like the EM utilities, for example, with the least dispersed um, mutual fund and ETF investor base. So these type of sectors and, and the stocks in these sectors might be subject to more volatility uh, if we are going to see especially a continued phase of speed rotations as we discussed in, in, in the beginning of, of these slides. 
So uh, I will be happy to answer any questions around this um, coming from the audience. And thanks for listening. Thank you, Sayad. Very interesting and definitely need to keep in mind the volatility of flows in the market and the changes in ownership dispersion and that relationship between dispersion and volatility. It's a good tee up for our next perspective about ESG. There are many new trends in the market and at the same time, the ESG movement has also gained steam. We're fortunate to have with us today Purva Chabra, who's a trader at Welton. And Purva, you also took on the role of ESG analyst. Looks like you're working two jobs. Is that right? Very, <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> Purva, you're in a multifaceted role searching for alpha. A couple of minutes and share with us the types of ESG data you're looking at. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Elizabeth. And, um, True, my role is multifaceted and I hope to bring that um, sense here um, in this panel today. Um, I'd like to start with uh, touching upon some evolving focus on responsible investing during and after COVID-19 and um, its recovery. And then really to talk about uh, how we see alternative data being leveraged in this space. Um, so the pandemic is um, this century's for sustainability crisis and um, really a big wake up call for um, the masses. Um, Cure 2020 in general has been a potential catalyst for responsible investing uh, with um, movements like the Black Lives Matter gaining traction, um, issues such as climate change, trade war, uh, major political disruptions having a direct impact on everyone globally. Um, uh, we have also additionally seen uh, as the lockdown restrictions kept many of us at home uh, for most of the year really. Um, in some areas, deforestation rates plunged, um, air pollution diminished, water quality improved, all very clear validations of the climate change hypotheses. Um, the year really showed that people care and therefore investors and investment managers will care too. Um, and we have also seen, um, we've been seeing um, uh, in the last couple of years that there has been an acceleration of sustainable investing, uh, which is already in progress, but managers are beginning to leverage unstructured data for measuring sustainability metrics, which is otherwise um, not, um, uh, not, not doesn't lead to unique signal generation if we use traditional data. And um, at Welton itself, we are looking at uh, a plethora of uh, alternative investment or ESG data uh, for investment purposes. We are utilizing um, natural language processing to scrape publicly available textual data. We are also using information from uh, various national and international organizations such as the United Nations, uh, World Bank, uh, Department of Energy to name a few. Um, another interesting implementation is in predicting economic risk uh, of high impact events to inform um, our strategies. For example, uh, one could monitor um, COVID case trends in each country to try and predict lockdowns um, and hence gauge the economic impact that it has on directly linked sectors. Um, obvious ones are hospitality or tourism. Um, and it really allows uh, Additionally, it allows the asset managers to create specialized offerings that can be focused on any of the E, S, or G pillars and not just doesn't have to be ESG as a whole. Um, we believe that as the ESG agenda continues to ramp up globally to build resiliency in portfolio performance, uh, in the post-COVID era, applications of alternative data will be very crucial. And I'm happy to delve into more detail in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Purva. Really great overview of the many facets of ESG. Let's move over to Kevin. Kevin Shea is CEO of Disciplined Alpha. Kevin has been building regime models for over a decade and has been implementing them in a long, short equity strategy for over seven years. It's great to have you here. Kevin, you've been analyzing the recent shift from growth regime to value regime that occurred last year. Syed talked about the rotation underway already. Why don't you take us through your perspective of the regime shift? When and how did you first notice this? And what are you learning from the data about this phase of the recovery? 
Sure. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so um, this uh, set of slides that we're going to rattle through is is um, really part of a much bigger presentation. And just as a resource to the audience, just feel free to um, contact me and I'll be happy to send you a much larger presentation. This is a, a long list of, of reasons why we uh, expect value to start outperforming growth. Um, uh, this kicked in in uh, the end of March last year, um, and then it started to kick in into the uh, overall results of uh, value outperforming growth a few months later in, uh, in August. Um, the points that we'll be able to go through today in a short period of time is really just uh, the first bullet point here about the unprecedented amount of growth outperforming value and time for mean reversion. And then we'll jump down to uh, the momentum risk to uh, growth stocks, the third one up from the bottom. So just jumping to the next slide, um, this is the unprecedented uh, uh, part of, of the presentation where this looks at the uh, rolling 12 month return of growth versus value. And uh, going back to the inception of these indices, as you can see, uh, as the end of August, uh, growth uh, actually had an unprecedented level uh, of outperformance on a rolling 12 month basis. Uh, it has since outperformed, uh, value has since outperformed by about 17 percentage points since the end of August. Uh, some people have asked, um, is this um, uh, move uh, complete at this point? As you can see, it's not anywhere close to being complete. Um, the end of August, uh, that outperformance was greater than the internet bubble in the late 1990s. Um, we're probably only about a third of the way of it uh, continuing to uh, reverse. And uh, there's probably another 25 to 35 percentage points of alpha absolute return, however you want to call it, by going long value and shorting growth. Um, on the next slide, I was going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, a momentum factor that it, that's very important that also um, had evolved uh, very significantly last year. Uh, price momentum, as, as, as people know, is one of the most widely used factors in the industry. It's used across value core growth strategies. It's used across fundamental technical quantitative strategies. Um, uh, even value managers like to use it so they're not buying a value stock that's kind of a quote unquote value trap and stays cheap forever. So what I've done here at the end of, uh, of, of August, um, this is something that has started to show up in, in Barron's actually just over the weekend and, and uh, some other uh, journals as well. Um, uh, so the end of August of 2020, the Russell 1000 uh, with the thousand names in it, we looked at the six month rolling price momentum uh, through the end of August. So think February to August of last year. It's top quintile, the top fifth of a thousand stocks by price momentum. So you've got 200 stocks on this chart that we're looking at here. Of those 200 stocks in red are the stocks that are in the Russell 1000 growth. And at the end of August, 77% were in the Russell 1000 growth, 55% were in the Russell 1000 value. Russell has an overlap of some of the stocks or some stocks from both indices. But the point is, is that just a short two and a half months later, as value started to outperform, uh, now at the middle of November, or then at the middle of November, 84% or 170 stocks out of those 200 stocks are in the Russell 1000 value. And now uh, at that point, only 60 stocks or 30% were in the Russell 1000 growth. So what happens here is basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. As value starts to outperform, it starts to screen better at the momentum factor level, which many people use, which cause more models to show up. Um, uh, value stocks is, is uh, better uh, screening stocks. And so uh, people just start buying them, they bid up and they continue to outperform. So then at the finally at the individual stock level on the next page, we'll just look at two stocks here. Um, on the next um, slide there. Um, so in red, we've got uh, uh, AMD and in, in green, we have Micron. So keep in mind, these are both US stocks that are large cap in the Russell 1000, in the tech sector, in the semiconductor industry group. So uh, we talked about how uh, growth did well through the end of August. And well, AMD uh, is just like Micron diversified across many end markets, but a lot of those end markets relate to the cloud overall and, and gaming in particular. And when you think about the work from home and stay at home kind of environment that the economy uh, went through, uh, and this chart, by the way, runs from 1231, 2019 through about a week ago. Um, as you would expect, the work from home type end markets did well. And so AMD, the semiconductor selling into those end markets uh, outperformed the market, which is shown in black uh, and, and other um, semiconductors. Um, well, as people started to look forward to the reopening of the economy and uh, the 
industrial sector and, and the automotive industry group in particular, uh, people started to uh, realize that those were going to eventually reopen. Uh, their numbers were all going to start to improve. And so Micron, uh, another semi started um, that sells into those end markets, started to outperform uh, just as AMD started to go sideways. And so this is just uh, an example at the stock level of the shift from uh, growth stocks to value stocks. So tried to go quickly through um, looking at the outperformance of growth versus value. Uh, as well as um, at, at the index level, as well as at the factor level, uh, using momentum as an example, and then at the individual stock level. But again, these are just parts of a much larger presentation. We'll be happy to get into those uh, later on, or if, if people want to uh, share that with me, that'd be great. Thanks. Excellent. Terrific. Thank you for sharing, Kevin. I mean, clearly a big shift in the markets added on to what we've already heard from our panelists. Uh, let's open it up to everyone, to questions for all of the panelists. Um, let's start with, let's go back to the jobs data here for a moment. Adam, what other content sets would you like to try analyzing along the job postings data? You talked about estimates, you've talked about the job postings data. What else, what, what, what other data sets would you like to bring into your analysis? Yeah, I mean, that's always a challenge, right? All these great ideas, but always short on time. So one thing I've been really interested in is layoffs data. So at Refinitiv, we have this uh, content set called Significant Developments, where it's human curated events, including layoffs. And I'd really like to study <clears throat> if I could figure out patterns of job postings data. You know, my, my hypothesis would be that as they're removed at a certain pace, maybe going down to down or close to zero, that relates to uh, layoffs and maybe even overlay of some of our machine readable news um, uh, to see if there's any hints using some deep learning like we've been playing with BERT also leading up to layoffs. So I think, you know, link up with to predict those layoff events from SIG devs would be really interesting. I, I'd love, if I, if I find the time, I'd love to dabble into that research because I think that would be a great pairing. Thank you. Yeah, I think what we're hearing so far in this webcast is the importance of additional data, right, to figure out and, and um, analyze and evaluate what's going on. Let's, um, I've got the remote control here. Let's move over to Mohammed. What, what will be the warning signs for the next dislocation? What, what data are you looking at to spot shifts so that, uh, you, you know, you get, uh, it's not a surprise what happens to funds like happened earlier last year? Uh, great questions. Um, so, so first, we're looking deeper uh, to under understand more consumer propensity to spend, uh, but across different consumer cohorts. And that's really spanning geography as different states start to maybe reopen. But more importantly, I think one big differentiator factor is across different income levels. Um, so the last statistics we see is that there is unprecedented level of excess saving. I think right now it's about $1.3 trillion compared to uh, the same time last year. And obviously we want to be the first to identify the magnitude, but also where that money goes once the consumer confidence uh, start to go up. So traditionally consumer transaction data is a great source for this. Um, we publish a weekly report on, it's called the first report on our website, uh, you know, for those who are interested to track this from a high level. Um, and then the next thing that is really interesting is on our radar is inflation. So, so this is a little harder to draw conclusion from typical transaction data. So we're adding SKU level data at our offering. So that would be a great way to track prices on many different consumer goods down to a very high level of granularity and get insights into uh, you know, inflation possibly from that. Um, another thing that is very important for recovery as well as uh, panels that can focus on gas pricing, supply and demand. And then finally, I'd say, you know, obviously on everybody's radar is payroll panels, which we're working on, and that can shed lights on things like labor expansion and uh, cost, and also provide, you know, more insights into things like, you know, COGS and, and gross margins. Thank you, Mohammed. Syed, let's stay on this point of inflation. The audience would like to hear about what is, what is the funds flow data telling us about inflation? Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Great question. Um, I think the first thing to no note about inflation is, is the amount of money 
um, sitting in money market funds as a as a result of increased saving rates. Um, the the excess uh, global cash uh, in in sitting in global money market funds we see uh, looking at EPFR data is up around thirty percent compared to pre COVID levels. Um, plus the other retail saving products uh, re we, we see. Um, Relative to pre-pandemic trends, it is estimated that around 3 trillion USD is sitting on cash or cash-like instruments only in the US. And, and in addition, we have these balance sheet expansions by the central banks, fiscal stimulus packages by the governments. So in total, we have this huge amount of cash sitting on the sidelines and that could be used uh, whether to inflate asset prices uh, or inflate uh, other consumable, consumable uh, products. So as a result of all of these, there is a, obviously a fear of inflation due to reflation, and we are seeing evidence uh, to that in, in fund flows to inflation protected bond funds, uh, which has seen uh, a significant uh, increase in flows. And another point, uh, increasing rates um, um, as a result, has also increased interest towards uh, bank loan funds and to some commodity funds uh, that are also good uh, global GDP growth plays. Very interesting. And and let's um, let's get another question into Kevin about the regime change. Um, last year, so in the data that you follow, Kevin, did you notice if the steep sell-off in March? and the subsequent rapid recovery in 2020 was different from any other market declines and recoveries? Uh, yes, actually it was. Um, typically in a market decline, quality works on the way down. So think you know, high cash flow margins um, or high free cash flow relative to net income quality measure in a number of ways. Um, value tends to work off the bottom. And then uh, as the economy ultimately recovers, and then at that point growth works for the next several years before you have another sort of market meltdown. Uh, this past year, it was different in that um, a lot of the work from home stocks, the stay at home stocks, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Zoom, and so on, happened to be growth stocks. So their business models were actually enhanced um, uh, during the pandemic. They outperformed on the way down, and they also outperformed on the way um, back up, which ultimately led to them being even more overvalued uh, than they were historically, which is yet one more reason why we uh, expect the growth stocks to underperform relative to value going forward. Okay, and let's wrap it up um, with Parva. A final question to Parva in the ESG space. Can you tell us about uh, what you're hearing from clients? Are clients mandating ESG strategies? What? Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing and hearing from clients. Um, yeah, thank you for the question, Elizabeth. So uh, we are seeing significant rise um, in investors who want to allocate their funds uh, with a purpose, uh, which is not just financial in nature. Uh, I mean, if we look at the last year trajectory, um, fund flows in sustainable uh, funds uh, increased and reached $51 billion in 2020 from a mere $21 billion in 2019. And I'm talking about fund flows in the US. Um, this number represented about one fourth of all the fund flows in stocks and bond funds in 2020. Um, and that's that's to see, that says a lot. Over the last year, in fact, uh, at Welton ESG research has been very vital to our firm's process um, in the way we integrate impactful investments. Uh, we are uh, continuing to widen the range of data we consume um, as we uh, continue to extend that sensitivity to the individual E, S, and G factors. Um, and really to design thematic trade signals um, for generating more alpha. Thank you very much. Okay, Parva, let's um, move on now to Bart. It wrap, we're wrapping up the panel today. We've covered a lot of ground. Let me hand it back over to you for the full open QA with the audience. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists. We're now gonna enter our Q and A session. And I wanna reiterate to everybody uh, please notice that there's a, a Q&A box on your screen and we are looking at those real time. So if you have any questions, please fire away. I know there's a lot of information that you've heard, um, but there's always more questions out there. So we're happy to take those. And um, we just had a question come in 
Uh, this one's for you, Adam. Which data point was more correct in terms of the stock performance? Well, okay, so that, uh, th that's a little complex to get, but I'll get into that. So we have a lot of prior research how um, analyst revisions lead to stock performance. I mean, that's the whole reason behind the Starmine Smart Estimates, wanting, as you saw, that little bit of edge before the consensus moves. We have other models like analyst revisions, the quant model we sell. So, you know, there's a lot of prior research, ours and in academia, showing that that's a huge phenomenon. Now with jobs, what we're trying to get at was to predict those revisions. So it wasn't, you know, I honestly, I never got a chance to backtest on the performance of that analyst awareness I was working on. I kind of got pulled onto a, another project about using learning to predict secondary offerings and investitures, but that's beside the point. Um, but yeah, so, you know, um, I think there's a huge potential, but it hasn't been tested just because you saw that there's a much larger, la much larger lead time be between job postings and analyst revisions, as opposed to you saw with um, the, the smart estimates versus the consensus where there's still a lead and there's still really good performance. So, I mean, <laughs> that'd be a great opportunity to have a look at the data yourself and check it out. Cause I, you know, just knowing that analyst revisions are so impactful, if you can predict the analyst revisions, then you're in a really good spot. Okay, um, Adam, this is like, a, this is another question that just came in. So since we've got you uh, focused on this, uh, plans to bring in other job listings data sets to Refinitiv, or can you offer a comparison of LinkUp with other vendors in the space? Thanks. I think, I think you want to stick with LinkUp right now. Yeah, I mean, LinkUp is who we partnered with. And right. what you saw was just one of the content sets we have from them. There's also more detailed so for every job posting, there's actually, um, you know, a record of the title, there's an ONET code about, you know, what type of job it is, whether it's a computer scientist or a security guard. So there's a lot more metadata data per job posting. So I focused it on the aggregate daily time series. But if you wanted to like track blue collar jobs versus white collar jobs, you could probably get that together with the larger table that has um, more details about each individual posting. Right. Got it. Yeah, I, I just think that link data and the time series is so important right now. I mean, that's going to be probably a very, very fast changing number that we're going to see as we uh, rapidly go back to, to hopefully some kind of normalcy. And uh, being able to trade against that with what you're offering is, is really impressive. Um, let me switch gears a little bit to uh, Sayad. Um, how do you think the rise in passive investment, I mean, this has been a huge issue, obviously, with people getting their checks and a lot of money going into these passive ETFs. Um, how is that affecting volatility around the, uh, the pandemic? What, what do you see from the fund flows in that area? Thank, thank you, uh, Bart. I, I think it's, it, there, there are two sides to, to this question. So uh, from an investor base perspective, passive investment is generally good uh, for most stocks uh, because they, they kind of provide liquidity uh, to the market, and if you if you see an increased ownership dispersion around uh, passive funds, it might be related with you know a, with index additions, or uh, it might be di directly related uh, with some uh, passive funds increasing uh, their AUMs. Then you will uh, then you will uh, see that the, uh, the overall volatility of the um, of those stocks being more and more owned by passive funds, having, um, a, by the way of having a more dispersed ownership structure, having a less and less um, a volatile outputs. Uh, but having said that, uh, the, uh, the underlying um, um, instrument, uh, I believe is also important. For example, ETFs, uh, if, if an ETF uh, from a passive perspective, owning a stock, uh, because it, it, how, it, um, how it operates, uh, the ETFs might have some uh, disproportionate effects on the stock prices and the volatility uh, at, the, at the stock level because, because the way of they, they simply work. So looking at uh, passive investments, I think um, discriminating between mutual funds and ETFs is also and uh, an important for, uh, point going uh, going forward, and also there is a, also another side of using these passive investment uh, vehicles that, and that will be the central banks, obviously, and the central banks um, 
starting have started to increase their allocations to some passive products especially some etfs and that is also affecting markets and the stock volatilities in a, in a positive way because they are long-term holders and uh, obviously there's a always a question what will happen when they start to decrease these positions but at least for the short term and the midterm they do have these um, investments in these ETFs which is helping to decrease the volatility in in most of the stocks yeah it's back it's back um, you know backing up all the uh, the current prices um, okay so Mohammed uh, the value of uh, back testing data can you tell us Obviously, with the with the pandemic, um, this is stuff. You know, this is uh, these are economy. These are markets we've never seen before. Is the value of alternative data back testing is it rising, falling, or remaining the same in your perspective? Uh, thanks. That's a great question, Bert. So I, I think the the value is definitely there. I, I have to be one way or the other comfortable that you know the the data can tell me something I can trust. The problem here is the way we used to go about it uh, is not going to be the same going forward, right? Because traditionally what we used to do is we look at different data panels. We run ensembles that, uh, you know, run individual models on the panels, and then we would weight them based on a loss function that is mostly driven from how accurately they use to predict uh, the KPIs that I'm trying to track. Uh, the, the problem here, as you saw from the slides, um, you know, a lot of the panels deteriorated almost simultaneously just because of those biases. So applying the same backtest methodology is just all what it will do is the weights of those loss function will be high relative to each other and then you're going to get very uh, messy results. So what, what we uh, suggest is going through a methodology where you're identifying, um, you know, stable cohorts within the different panels. And that comes by asking provider for dimensions like age and uh, age group and, you know, uh, income levels as much as possible to identify uh, cohorts. Um, and then use methodologies to basically remove those biases by looking for panels that um, have opposite biases. So when you put it all together and normalize it as a whole, uh, you're able to get a more representative of, let's say, U.S. consumer overall. And then that, you know, apply the, the back test to that rather than the, the, the old way. Right. You know, um, OK, hang on. We just had a question come in here. Well, this is interesting. I might this. I just might throw this out to everyone. Uh, didn't get to read it completely, but risk models have generally failed in the bizarre situations we have recently seen in some stocks driven by certain retail influencers. For example, the uh, GME slash Robinhood phenomenon. Are any quantitative methods out there for positioning or repositioning assets, given these rather unprecedented? And what we perceive as irrational moves, or is it a lost cause? That's a very interesting question. Can quants ameliorate these strange, bizarre, out of the ordinary occurrences where gangs of uh, retail investors get together and drive a stock up? I think is what what the question is. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, who can best uh, handle that one. Um, maybe the transaction. Uh, maybe maybe Mohammed. Is that either Mohammed or Syed? What, what do you guys think? It's, it's a very interesting topic. We're definitely looking into ways of uh, providing panels on top of retail trader sentiment. Um, you know, I've used a lot of data in the past that focus more on an institutional crowding, whether on the long and the short side. And yeah, you can definitely build models around it and, and see different uh, things that, that can give you an indication of how that can impact uh, the price performance short term. Uh, but now there is a lot of pressure of retail. There are some panels out there that focus on that. And I think over the next few months, there will be a lot more that, that gives more analytics on, on, on the sentiment, but also the crowding. Yeah, uh, definitely. Okay, I just have a, a, an overall question for everyone. And that is, um, if you look at the overall market, you look at the liquidity, the market, look what the Fed is doing. Take, tell me from your perspective, and you all have a unique insight into a specific component of the of, of the data world tell me are we at the um 
you know, are we going to collapse tomorrow? Are we going to collapse next year? Is this uh, bull run going to continue? What is the data telling you where we are going to end up in the next six to 12 months? Just give us a little bit of a picture on that. And I want to go through everyone. Let's start with, uh, let's start with Perva. What is the ESG, for instance, telling you? Are we are, are we coming out of this? Is this coming to an end? Is the party, is the music going to stop and there aren't going to be enough chairs left and we're all going to be in trouble? Or what, what, what are you seeing? I mean, this, uh, but I think this is the point in time where we really need a crystal ball, but unfortunately we don't have one. Uh, and it's also an interesting question in terms of what each country is at, like with COVID recovery, every country is in different phases. Some countries are going back in lockdown and there's really no telling um, what the markets are doing. And there is, uh, I mean, we have seen positive correlations between uh, sectors, which we would have not seen otherwise, just looking at uh, what the treasuries are doing. And so it's really hard to um, kind of say what's going to happen in the next year, um, just going by, by financial data. But if you look at ESG space, um, I think we're just expecting more fund flows overall um, and just uh, trying to factor in that crisis risk uh, predictions in our models. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's keep this to a lightning round level. Uh, we're running out of time, so try to keep your answers to one minute. Sayad, what's your perspective on fund flows? You're watching all the, uh, all the cash flying around. What's, where, is that going to continue? Yeah, I think that's that's the main question. But historically, uh, the increased cash has been always a good contrarian indicator for the future market performance. Obviously, there's a dilemma here about the inflation and reflation coming in. And if we if if we if we see that um, the uh, job growth and all the other um, fundamental metrics are in line, then I think we we, we will. Uh, be able to see that huge amount of cash starting to enter to, uh, to other types of uh, in instruments like equities or bonds. We have seen some around November 2000, um, uh, November 2020, when, when the vaccine news arrived, we have seen some decrease in uh, money market funds. Uh, but after that, we didn't see that continuing. So uh, I will expect uh, with the ongoing growth, I will expect that money to flow from money market funds to other types of uh, flows um, okay. and asset classes. Okay, so so the uh, the game continues. Uh, Mohammed, you want to do a quick um, quick minute? Sure. So I mean, the data is providing more views on on the fundament, fundamental aspect of the market, right? But at the at this point, I think the fundamentals are completely disconnected, as we probably all agree, from the price performance. I think it's right now more related to really monetary and, and fiscal policy. So yeah, the data can probably provide a fast reaction of any of this change, uh, but I don't think it's it's giving a really good indication about the, the actual market uh, performance by itself. Okay, I gotcha. Um, Adam, do you want to have one more comment? Yeah, I mean, we saw on aggregate, um, companies are very exuberant with their hiring, but if you go into the weeds, you, not every company is on board. I mean, same with the analysts too, it's mixed reactions. So I think uh, overall we're doing well, but it's still important to focus on company by company because no matter what the regime is, if you can sort the good from the bad or the bad from the less bad, you'll do well in your investments. And that's kind of been our philosophy at Storm. Okay, Kevin, you've got five seconds. What do you think? Growth is, growth is going to underperform value, but remember back 0002, growth underperformed by 41%, but at the same time, value is down 15. So you can't just get this spread by going long value ETF. You need to go long value and short growth. That's the trick. Okay, long value, short growth. Okay, well, that just about wrap things, wraps things up. Thank you again to our sponsors, Refinitiv Factius, EPFR, and Forma Financial Intelligence. And thank you to you all. Thank you to all. Uh, a recording will be made available in the next couple of days. We look forward to connecting back with you at our next Battle Blitz webinar. Stay tuned. All the best. Bye bye.